the central narrative action of Parshat Shmini has to do with two of Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, bringing a foreign fire, an Eshazara, into the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, in the recently inaugurated, they just opened it up for the first time, the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert, and it doesn't go well. Uh, a fire comes out from God and consumes them and they die. This is uh, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. Vayomer Moshe el Aharon, and afterwards Moshe says to Aaron, his brother, Hu asher diber Hashem lemor, this is what God said, saying, Bikrovai ekadesh, through those close to me I will be sanctified, Vialpane kol ha'am ekaved, and in front of all of the nation I will be honored. And what does Aaron say in response? The conclusion of this verse, Vayidom Aharon, and Aaron was silent. The Midrash that uh, the Torah Tamima cites here is taken from the Talmud tractate Zvachim. Vayidom Aaron. This is on Daf Kuf Tet Vav Amud Bet. Aaron was silent. Here's the Midrash. Amar lo Moshe la Aaron. Moshe said to Aaron, Aaron achi, Aaron my brother, lo matu banecha ela lahakdish shemo shel akadosh baruchu. Your children did not die except for to sanctify the name of God, meaning the reason they died was to sanctify God's name. And once Aaron knew that his children were known to God, meaning were special, they were special in this sense, Shatak v'kibel schar, he was silent and received reward. Shenemar, as it says, quite it now quotes our verse, Vayidom Aaron, Aaron was silent. Torah Tzimima is going to use this as a jump off to ask some broad questions about this story and this Midrash, especially as it compares with some other Midrashim. Uh, famously, the story of Nadav and Avihu uh, bringing this uh, false or foreign fire into the Mishkan uh, spawned many, many different Midrashim explanations about what exactly did they do wrong to merit death. And interestingly, there's a tension within those Midrashim. Some of them uh, use it as an opportunity to say that Nadav and Avihu did something wrong, and they're bad, they're condemned for what they did, and God killed them. This Midrash and others like it say, no, Nadav and Avihu are on such a high level, spiritually, um, religiously, that they, it, th this is an opportunity to praise them. The Torah Tamim is going to sort of try to navigate some of this. It's a lengthy comment, and I will not read it in, in its entirety, but we'll get a good sense of what he wants to say. Mivor b'gemara de Moshe ha'yedea mikvar shekashar yishra kadosh baruch hashkena tol ha'mikdash yikadesh v'nich badav ba'ofen kazeh. It is explained elsewhere in the same Talmudic passage that Moshe actually already knew that something bad was going to happen at the inauguration of the Mishkan. This is related to an earlier Midrash that we cited a couple weeks ago, vis-a-vis -vis Moshe's knowledge about what was going to happen. He knew that holy people would be used by God to sanctify God's name, but he didn't know who. Now, how, by the way, there's an earlier passage in Parshat Titzave five or six weeks ago that we read, where more than that at this two months at this point, where God says, "Venikdash bichvodai," I will be sanctified through or with or in my honor. The Gemara elsewhere understands this not as bichvodai, but ella bimekubadai through those that honor me. Here. The Torah to me was relating to this and this Gemara as an understanding that what was predicted in Parsha Tetzaveh gave Moses some foresight that something bad was going to happen. Of course, that is not explicit at all in the text of the Torah itself. This is an allusion, a midrash, a connecting connecting two different midrashic ideas. Velo nirmaz lemosha mihem but it wasn't implied to him who the people would be. 
Ad she matu Nadav and Avihu. It was only when Nadav and Avihu die in our Parsha that Moshe says, Ah, this is what God meant way back in Parsha Tetzaveh when it was when God said, I will be sanctified through my honor. This was I see now it was a reference to Nadav and Avihu. Moshe then in our Midrash and Zvachim says that we knew God was going to sanctify uh, through those close to him. This also helps explain why in our verse it says this is what God said he would do. Again, it never said explicitly anywhere what God would do. So if you understand this to be a reference to Parsha Tetzave, it's to help solve this textual problem as well. But now, Torah Tamima is going to ask some questions. Ach tzarech iun bechlala drasha. I, this, there's some questions to be asked about the general idea of this midrash, where Moshe says, lo, lo matu banecha ela lahakti shmo, that your sons only died to sanctify God's name. Because don't we know that there is other midrashim which in, uh, indicate and imply that there was other reasons why Nadav and Avihu were killed? One famous one that he cites here is that the problem with Nadav and Avihu is that they poskined, they cited, they judged on a halachic matter in front of their teacher. Here it could be Aaron. So the, the, he says that there's many, the Gemara and Midrash have a bunch of reasons why they might have died, having to do with them actually doing something bad. So what does it mean here in our Midrash to say that they died to sanctify God's name? Because you can't, if, you, if it was just to sanctify God's name, you, then there's also additional questions. Why was it done during this eight-day, uh, the period of the Miluim, the inauguration of the Mishkan, which was a happy period, Hayazman Simcha? Shouldn't have happened then if it was just to sanctify God's name. And should they have died in the Mikdash, in this holy place, just to sanctify God's name? That also doesn't make sense. He asks an additional question. Why would it be chosen to inaugurate the Mishkan, the tabernacle, to kill? What's the purpose? Killing these people of such high regard. And what does it mean to say that Moshe knew that was, this was going to happen? What's the nature of the sanctification of God's name here? A lot of good questions. So the Torah Mima has his own unique personal answer to this, which I find compelling. Nira Lomar Svara Agadit we can propose an Agadic uh, answer, reason for this. We know from various sources that what was the purpose of having a mishkan, having a tabernacle in the first place, and God's dwelling there, the bringing of sacrifices. What's all of that about? To make amends, to make uh, kapara, atonement, for that which any Israelite would do improperly. And therefore, we don't want people to think that after all of this, we don't want people to think that now that there is going to be a mechanism for achieving atonement, that you can therefore violate the mitzvahs. You might think that, hey, since there is a mechanism to it, take care of it, take care of me if I mess up, now I can mess up. Therefore God wanted for us to know that 
These things do not protect you if you do something purposefully against what God desires. Only those who do things accidentally or they make a mistake does this, this does kapara's atonement achieved. And this, how did God... So there's a problem, right? The problem that the Torah Tamim is noting is that this was the first week in Jewish and Israelite history where there's a mishkan, there's going to be sacrifices. There's going to be a way of saying, I messed up, let me bring something to make atonement for what I did. The problem that the Torah Tamim is proposing is that people will start thinking, hey, now that I know I can mess up and it'll be okay, I can mess up more. You hear stuff like this asked usually around Yom Kippur. Some smart guy or gal in shul will say, hey, if, I, if you're so confident that this Yom Kippur thing works, then why do I have to be good the rest of the year? It's a question that makes some sense. According to the Torah Tzmima, God tries to show an answer to that question here in our Parsha through the death of Nadav and Avihu. That even though they were holy, righteous people, or you could say especially because they were the holiest and righteous of people, righteousest of people, most righteous. Nevertheless, when they did something wrong, according to those Midrashim that say they did something wrong, like giving uh, judgments in front of their master or coming into the Mishkan drunk or inebriated, lo hegina alehim kedushat the Mishkan. The Mishkan will not protect them. This whole system, this mechanism, still can't protect them. V'af ki od biyotam betocho l'kayim nor alehim amikdashecha, even while they were inside of the Mishkan, which you might have thought, okay, that's like a safe zone. They'll be fine while they're in there. No. Not even there. And he says that this, uh, this kind of solves all of these questions. They all come together nicely with this understanding. And that the so what now the conclusion of the midrash was that Aaron is silent, and he receives um, reward for being silent. It's problematic, difficult text. So now he concludes his discussion here, the Torah Tamima, talking about that part of the Midrash. He relates it to another Agadah, another rabbinic dictum in Masachet Brachot, Daf Vav Amud Bet. Agra de Beitamya Shetikuta. The reward for going to a house of mourning is, comes from the silence. Now, this is from a run of statements in the Talmud there that say the reward for X is Y. And the function of those statements is to say as follows. The reward you get, you get a reward for going uh, to a house of mourning if you're coming to console. You get the reward to the degree that you are shitikuta, silent, shtika. That's how we typically understand that Gemara. That if you go to pay a consolation visit, you should just sit quietly unless the person wants to talk to you and engage you. But you don't have to put anything, your own stuff on them. Listen, watch, be respectful, be quiet. That's the reward that you get comes from your silence. Ah, but the Torah to me says, but I don't understand that answer. Why should there be a reward for silence, he says. So that's a pastoral question we could talk about separately. What is the best way to act in a house of mourning? Here, the Torah Tamima says, why, why be silent? What's the reward there? He says, no. The reward isn't that. What's our Parsha telling us here? Lafi Agadazu, what it says about Aaron being silent, near a Dekaila Avel, the reward that that Gemara and Brachot isn't talking about the consolers, but about the mourner, the silence of the mourner themselves. When you have consolers coming to you, but you receive your pain and suffering in silence, you sit quietly, 
Mikabel Baratzon Gezerat HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this shows that you are receiving God's judgment. And when you do so silently, that too brings reward and bring to you because it brings, it's, a, it's considered a Kiddush Hashem. Uh, that's a sanctification of God's name that you're performing. Also, this is difficult. You know, if someone were to lose a loved one, especially a, young, a loved one who died before their time, who died young, very difficult to expect someone to just receive that and take that silently and not cry, not actively mourn, not question. But according to the Torah, it's mainly here, this is what is expected. Uh, not, or if not expected, that there is a level of reward that if you manage to do that, nonetheless, that brings glory to God. So that's a powerful idea. It's not necessarily halach uh, la It's not necessarily how I would say someone should act in the time of mourning. The way Aaron undertook his children's death with silence is very profound, and we have respect for it, uh, but not necessarily what we expect of people in our day and age to respond to, to death and tragedy in their own lives on this level. It's a very interesting story, narrative, very interesting midrash and commentary as always by the Torah Tamima. Look forward to learning with you more next week.